loving my Jesus. Play it through one more time. If you want us to sing it, come back. Loving my Jesus. Showing my scars. Telling my Loving my Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow. May I make your name known. May that be my legacy. I love that line in that song. So, so powerful. Well, church family, this has been a very special day for our family. I am uh, more than honored uh, to be able to baptize our youngest son. And as I said from the baptistry a moment ago, I'm grateful that we can raise our boys in this church where Jesus is taught and displayed before them. So thank you all for helping us to do that and, and for Carrie and I to have family here today. Uh, we're, we're excited and glad that we're able to celebrate a very special day. And to our pastor, I want to thank our pastor for the privilege of being able to, uh, to, to come up here and preach. Uh, he invited me last week, and uh, I want you to remember our pastor and Miss Joan in prayer. Miss Joan's mom went home to be with the Lord, and we want to pray for them. We're so grateful for our pastor. Aren't you grateful for your pastor? We have a tremendous pastor. And he is not at all selfish with his pulpit and how he leads and loves on us and mentors us. And it is a privilege to serve with this staff and with this music ministry family. I have to brag on our music ministry family. From, from what you see up here to what you see back in the media room, these people love Jesus. I'm just going to be honest with you. They love Jesus. And I am grateful for what they do every single week to lead us in worship. And I am proud of how they let the Lord use them. And I want to encourage them this morning, whether they're uh, watching us online, and for those that are watching us online, we welcome you. And uh, for all of our church family, we're just so grateful to serve with you. And I, I have prayed, I have wrestled this week. I'm going to be honest with you, I have wrestled this week. Now, if you're a guest here today, and you came to hear Pastor LeBron, we're praying that he'll be back next Sunday so that you can hear some good preaching next week. Right now, you're stuck with me for today. We'll get through it. And next week, uh, hopefully our pastor will be back. Uh, but I've been wrestling since he asked me and invited me to preach about what God would allow me to share with you from his word today that would challenge all of us in our faith walk, that would encourage all of us. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, life is tough. We're out there living it. It doesn't matter if you're in the middle of work, if you're retired, if you're a student, if you're a teacher who is now excited because the school year is off for the summer it doesn't make three of you yeah that's it doesn't matter uh, where you are in life you understand a very real truth today with me and that is this you understand what it means to fail do you ever feel like a failure do you ever feel like uh, you are weak do you ever feel like you have lost your focus you see, I'm saying something this morning that I think every one of you in here would agree with, that life is full of challenges that we have to face. And, and you may have brought some of those challenges in here with you this week. You've been trying to do something, trying to accomplish something. Every corner you're turning, everywhere you're going, you're hitting uh, distractions and discouragement, and it's just not coming together, it's not working out. You're working and working and working at it in your spiritual walk. Maybe it's something with your family, something with your health, something at home, something at work, whatever. Every single one of us understands that life is full of challenges. And the issue is not will you face challenges and failures, but the issue is how in the world 
do we deal with them when they come our way? So don't let it be a surprise to you. It's not anything new. You're going to face failures. And in, in fact, th- let's, just, let's just get real for a minute. We're a room full of failing people in here. Every one of us in here, starting with, we're all a bunch of failures, right? But I want to show you in God's Word this morning something that I think will be incredibly powerful for you. There's a story of a man talking about failure that wanted to uh, get the attention, wanted to woo uh, a lady, and so he began to write some letters to her, and he, he wrote the first letter and didn't get any kind of response. Now, that tells you how long ago this was, because I don't know of many people that use uh, mail anymore other than email, but this person wrote a, a letter and didn't get any kind of response. And so he thought, well, maybe I just need to get a little more serious about this. So he began writing a letter a week. No response. So he thought, well, obviously I'm not trying hard enough because I'm pretty sure that, that that's the only reason why I'm not getting a response. So I'm going to really double down on this thing. I'm going to write a letter a day to this, to this lady. So he wrote a letter a day. No response. So then finally, in one last effort, he thought, you know what? I am just going to make sure that she knows exactly my interest, and so I'm going to write two letters a day. So over a 24-hour period, the Postal Service delivered this lady two letters a day. She ended up marrying the mailman. Life is full of, I'm going to try hard, I'm going to try hard, I'm going to come up short. But I want to show you in God's Word how some of Jesus' closest followers dealt with failures and how Jesus responded to them. Today I'm going to preach on this subject, Jesus never fails. Would you find in your copy of God's Word, the Gospel of John, chapter 21, and we're going to read the first 14 verses of John chapter number 21, beginning in verse number 1. And I want to invite you, if you will, this morning to stand with me in honor and respect to the reading of God's holy word. And I believe in a room with the number of folks that we have today that someone in this room understands, even right now in this moment, failure. You're trying on your own, you're trying to do something, and it's not working out, and you need to hear this word this morning. So hear the story that takes place in John 21, beginning in verse number 1. Now the Bible says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, And two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children... Have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord... He put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with the fish. Then, as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish had laid on it bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Father, 
this morning I am asking for a touch of the Holy Spirit. I am praying this morning for that person who is sitting in this congregation or watching online that is understanding very presently and very clearly what it means to fail, what it means to be discouraged, what it means to be trying to do things on their own account, their own accord, and they're getting nowhere. And I pray this morning through the power of the Holy Spirit and through your holy, inerrant, infallible, perfect word that you will speak directly into their hearts through me that they might understand that Jesus never fails. And we can place our faith, we can place our trust, our hope, and our future squarely on the person, the promises, the provisions, and the precepts of Jesus and you work everything out just right. We love you today, Father, and we worship you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you this morning, church. You can be seated. I want to challenge all of us. I want to encourage you through this word this morning. And I, I want us to begin just very quickly here by placing the scripture rightly where it needs to be in context in light of the other scripture and sort of put a timeline to some things here so you can understand maybe what's going on in the world of these seven men who have set out on a fishing trip. This is not an ordinary fishing trip. This is not an ordinary situation that we're dealing with here. Now, this text takes place between Easter, the crucifixion, the death, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and it happens just before Pentecost, when the promised, what we call the paraclete, or the promised helper, the Holy Spirit, was to come and be given for the benefit of men to carry out ministry, for women to carry out ministry, for people to minister in the name of Jesus. So it's a sort of an in-between time there, and some days after the week of unleavened bread, there are uh, feasts going on, things happening there which are sort of navigating the direction of the disciples. Now the last time that we saw them, they were in Jerusalem, but when chapter 21 opens, they have made their way to what this section calls the Sea of Tiberias. It is in fact the Sea of Galilee, the Gospel of John. It's the only place that refers to it as the Sea of Tiberias. It is the Sea of Galilee. They have made their way to Galilee. We also refer to this, this 21st chapter, as the epilogue. It is the closing out of the Gospel of John, sort of the summary of the Gospel of John. It, it is paralleled with the prologue, which we find in the first 14 verses of chapter number 1. In the prologue, we see the pre-incarnate Jesus. We learn about who Jesus was before he came to dwell among humanity. In these last verses, this epilogue, chapter 21, we learn about who Jesus is as the post-resurrection Savior. We learn about the instructions of Jesus. We get important lessons directly from Jesus. Do not remove yourself from this, church. This is practical for everyday living. This is not just meant for the disciples it was written to. This is applicable to your life and where you are today. Now, there are debates among commentators as to why Simon Peter and the other six went fishing. Some of you love to fish, so you don't have to debate any reason to go fishing. You just understand if it's a day that's nice and you can go fish, you go fishing. Some commentators say that maybe the reason why Simon Peter, and there's actually a total of seven disciples that are on this fishing trip, and it's sort of interesting and not at all surprising, really, that Simon Peter is leading the way. And so uh, some commentators suggest that Maybe in light of the fact that Jesus was not with them anymore and uh, maybe they were just simply uh, abandoning the mission that had been given to them and returning to what was familiar to them. You know, these are professional fishermen here. They understood the art of fishing. They had it together. They knew where to go and what to fish with and the time of day to go and what to catch and so forth. So maybe, just maybe, they were returning to something they understood, something they knew something they were comfortable with they had been stretched a little bit life had gotten real crazy for them and so r rather than just kind of dealing with that maybe they're just returning back to what was comfortable uh, some commentators say that well maybe they were just simply doing something to not be idle 
sort of their version of having a little hobby to do or something. They understood fishing. They needed something to do. It was an in-between time, as we said, and so they're just trying to figure out, okay, well, maybe we'll just nothing to do today. Let's just go fishing, you know? Some commentators say that it could be even something as simple and practical as they were hungry. And because they couldn't just go down to the grocery store or the restaurant and pick up some food, they needed to do something very practical. They needed to eat. And in order to eat, they needed to go catch some fish. I'll be honest with you, in, in, in light of the lesson and the message that we get from this, regardless of what the reason is, what we see here is that whatever brought them to that situation, they understand in this scripture the entirety, the understanding, the concept that without the Lord, there is nothing that is going to succeed. They understood failure on this particular fishing trip. Now, I want to give you two points this morning out of this text that I hope will encourage you and challenge you. Now, you're going to hear this first point, and you're going to think that's not encouraging at all. All right? So I'm just warning you, but here it is. Humans are weak, limited people who fail and lose focus. Humans are weak, limited people who fail and lose focus. It doesn't matter what kind of opinion that you may have about yourself, that I may have about myself. There is an end to the abilities that you and I have. You and I only have certain physical abilities. We have limitations. You and I have only certain abilities at anything that you can give an example of. You and I are capable, more than capable, of failing. We're also capable of losing focus. I wonder here in the text... And I don't want to read too much into it, but just analyzing where Peter's coming from. I wonder if in somewhere in Peter's mind, he's thinking back to the triple denial of Jesus. Wouldn't you think that would weigh on him? Wouldn't you think that the failure of standing up and saying, yes, this is my Savior. This is my Lord. This is the man that I have followed. Wouldn't you think that in some place in his mind, maybe it's rolling around that I... I, I didn't speak up when I should have. I, I didn't stand up for the Lord when I should have. I can't help but wonder if, if maybe that's rolling through his mind at some point. And there must have been somewhere in his mind. Uh, C.S. Lewis, the author of the Screw Tape Letters, gives us a description of the strategy of Satan. Another author came along, Erwin Lutzer, and he, he put a summary to what he believes was the description that C.S. Lewis gives, and I think is, is really interesting to sort of ponder on. He says it, Satan's strategy is to get Christians to become preoccupied with their failures, and from then on, the battle is won. I want to tell you something this morning. Focusing on your past failures is a tool that Satan uses to pull your focus off of your calling. Because God says and demonstrates all in his word what he wants to do with the life of a surrendered Christian. God's got incredible plans for every one of you that knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there is nothing easier in the hands of the enemy to remind you of who you used to be. Or even as a Christian for the times that you didn't speak up for the Lord, much like Peter. Don't get down on Peter and these other guys. They're people just like us. And they had failures and shortcomings too. But I want to tell you, and some of you are living in that maybe right now. You are having your thought life invaded with reminders of what you were, who you were, what you did. The times that you didn't stand up and succeed and do the things that you needed to for Jesus. And he is gripping you and he is keeping you from surrendering to the commands of the Lord in your life so that God can do something absolutely incredible, absolutely extraordinary with your life. It's affecting you to the very core of who you are. Man, if he can get you to focus on your failures, he's got a hold on you and he can keep you from... Listen. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with fishing. Amen? The more y'all speak, the shorter my sermon gets, okay? The truth is, is that there's nothing wrong with their little fishing expedition as it was. Fishing is a good thing. 
I mean, in a practical sense, what they were doing was a good thing. But it wasn't the best thing. So I would even submit to you this morning that sometimes uh, we can get so focused on doing something that might not be bad, it might be good, but we're doing good things instead of doing great things. That can happen in your life personally and in my life personally, and that can happen in a corporate sense as a church. Sometimes churches can get so busy doing things that are good that we miss doing things that are great. So I want you to see here in this text that we're dealing with perhaps some guys that are struggling with some past failures. Maybe that's driving them back to something that they know or they're comfortable with. Notice that they went fishing at night. Now, again, we're dealing with professional fishermen here. Maybe these guys understood that if you fish at night, uh, maybe the fish aren't going to see the nets as well. It's dark, and so they were maybe implementing some of that. or uh, I don't know. Maybe there's something more to it than that. Because I know for me personally, there's crazy things that happen with your thought life at night, isn't there? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, as the sun goes down and night happens, and you see it in Scripture, uh, th there's things that happen when, when the world around you gets uh, dark at nighttime. It's like you get, you know, that seems to be a time that the enemy wants to attack. So maybe it's no coincidence that they were trying to do things on their own at night, and they were failing at night. Maybe there's some correlation there. The major overwhelming truth is that we cannot accomplish anything apart from Jesus Christ. We can plan, and we can scheme, and we can strategize, and we can fret, and we can worry, and we can wring our hands. We can optimize and customize. We can prioritize. But if it's not in the power and the obedience and the leadership of Jesus Christ, it is of no good. We can work and work and work. And as our fellows here are seeing in these first four verses, uh, they can work and work and do what they know, and if the Lord is not in it, then it will come to naught. And I want to show you there that there is a better way. I want to show you there's a better way. Look in verse number 5 now. We see that humans are weak, limited people. When we peruse through the first four verses there, we see our disciples on their fishing trip, and verse number 4 says... Uh, that when the morning came, the disciples came back on their fishing trip, busted up. They were broken. They had no fish. Uh, that must have been a terrible discouragement to them. Must have been a terrible discouragement to them. But notice what happens in verse number 5. It says, Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? I want to be transparent with you for just a moment. There's nothing worse than going fishing having absolutely nothing in the live well or nothing in the cooler and having some dear person call out to you, Hey, have you caught anything? That'll bless your heart right there. Children, have you caught anything? Now, it's interesting because they couldn't tell. They didn't know it was Jesus yet, the Scripture says. They were looking, and maybe it was because it was foggy. Maybe there's something else, and we'll get to that in a second, that kept them from really seeing what was going on there. But regardless of the fact, that must have really started sort of drawing into them. And they had to admit in that moment, no. Look at the text. Children, have you caught anything? And they didn't give a bunch of excuses. They just simply said no. We're failures. We tried all night. We employed every technique that we knew. We're coming back, and we're empty-handed. Well, it gets a little bit better because then in the first part of verse number 6, he says, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. Can I be transparent with you again? Other than coming back busted on a fishing trip and not having anything and having somebody ask you if you'd had a, a catch of the day, the only thing that might be worse than that is for, for you to have somebody that then tries to tell you how to fish, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, have somebody, and, and, and remember, these guys are professional fishermen. But here comes this person, and they didn't know him uh, or didn't recognize him. Well, why don't you try fishing on the other side of the boat? 
the natural human tendency would be to either maybe ignore that or just say, you know what, if you're going to be nice, but sir, just, you know, we're, we're tired, we'll just forget about it. But something was happening there. They were recognizing, beginning to see something at play here. And I can't gloss over the fact that if we're honest, that's a little bit crazy. Like, it's a little bit like, think about it. They're in a boat. Isn't this that the water's the same on both sides? I mean, think about that for a second. Like, they're fishing on this side of the boat, and he's like, so why don't you guys try fishing on the right side of the boat? Wrap your mind around that for a little bit. Like, something magical happens whenever you start, like, the water was weird on the left side of the boat. Something happened over here. They just didn't favor the left side. But if you go to the right side of the boat, and, and so maybe in their minds somewhere they're thinking, wow. Maybe, just maybe in your life, you're hearing a voice that's telling you to do something, and you're kind of going, really? Wow. Wow. That seems a little out there. Can I tell you that there was absolutely nothing special? And 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 if we, some of you th may think you're professional fishermen in here. I don't know. Maybe you'll agree with me. I don't know that we have too many professional fishermen in here. I've heard some of your stories, but maybe you'll agree with me. There really wasn't anything magical about this side of the boat. This side of the boat. There was nothing special there. Can I tell you what was going on here? It was a request to obey what the Lord was telling them to do. Had nothing to do with this side or that side or whatever. It was, I'm going to call out to them, and I'm going to see if they're going to keep trying to do it in their way, or if they're going to listen to me and do it my way. You see, what we're finding here now is that we are weak, limited people who fail and lose focus. But beginning in verse number 5, what we see here is that Jesus, only Jesus, is our resource. Who's your resource? Jesus. Who's your provider? Jesus. Who is the only one that you can absolutely place your faith, your hope, your trust, everything in? Jesus. In a volatile world when everything is crazy, and I mean crazy, things just don't make sense anymore. Not that they ever really did, but they just don't make sense anymore. And in your life, things are not making sense. Who can you really trust? Jesus. In those first verses that we read there, when he tells them to cast on the other side there, we learn that, that Jesus is our resource. He gives us instruction. Sometimes you may not feel like it, but it doesn't matter what you feel like. The Bible proves to us Jesus has, God has, an incredible plan for your life. He wants to do something amazing with you. He wants to bless you. He wants to use you. He wants to reach people with you. He wants to do big, big things things with you and so he is like god is that father that is giving instruction he is giving a resource of teaching all along the way these men had been under the teaching leadership of jesus for so long and yet again even in his post-resurrection as he was revealing himself to him he was yet again giving instructions to them they had to admit that they were failures that's part of instruction Jesus asks this even today when we try to do things on our own. Have you caught anything? Have you been successful? So the men obeyed the instructions that Jesus gave them. Folks, you, would, you will admit with me, I think, on this. Obedience is not easy, is it? Disobedience comes natural to humanity. We are a fallen group of people. We are depraved people. Babies are sweet, cute little things. My boys were, I don't, I know you all think that you had good looking children. My children look so much better than any of your children. I had great looking children. I love my boys. I didn't have to teach my boys how to disobey. 
my boys came preloaded with the ability to disobey. That's installed because of the fall. You know what I'm saying? That was, that was already there. There's a story of a, a, a children's hospital where a young boy was known to wreak havoc. And he would absolutely cause chaos with the staff there. And so there was a visitor that uh, made a, tried to make a deal with the boy and said, Well, look, <clears throat> if you'll behave for one week, I'll give you a dime when I come back. That's all you got to do. You just got to behave. That's it. Just all week long, just behave. So a week passed, and the person came back and decided he was going to check on the boy and so she went into his room and stood at the foot of his bed and said, all right, I'm back and I told you I promised you I would bring you a dime. All you had to do is all week just behave. Now, I'm not going to ask the nurses and the staff if you behave. I'm going to ask you, did you behave this week? After a moment's pause, a small voice from among the sheep said, maybe you better give me a penny. It's so hard to obey sometimes. Just being real. Just being honest. Because sometimes it means that I have to admit I'm a failure. Sometimes it means that I have to give something up that is not Christ honoring in my life. Did you hear me, church? Sometimes it means I've got to get rid of some kind of a distraction. Sometimes it means I have to understand the, that I'm not going to understand it. I mean, sometimes there's what seems to me like crazy things. But God sees around corners. We don't see around the curves. We don't see the plan way down the road. He does, and so it may not make sense now, but it might make sense later. Or it makes complete sense to God. So honestly, it doesn't really matter if it makes sense to me or you. We just need to obey it. Sometimes you just look at your kids and say, well, it's just because I told you so. Can I get a witness? Don't act like you've not ever told your children that. Sometimes you just look at him and say, it's just because I told you so. That's all you need to understand. And so sometimes we just need to take God at his face value and take God at, at his obedience, and we don't have to get the explanation. We just need to obey and understand that God's got our best interest in mind. I want you to understand, Jesus is a wonderful teacher who gives the very best instruction. He's got your best plan in mind. Obedience, get this, obedience is the key that unlocks the door of God's blessing. Now, I'm not telling you that if you obey Jesus, that you're going to suddenly get the car that you've always wanted. That's not what that scripture says. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible doesn't say that if you obey Jesus, that you're going to get your mortgage paid off. The Bible doesn't say that if you obey Jesus, that you're even going to be happy 100% of the time. I'm telling you this because I'm not selling you a lie. I'm telling you what the gospel is. The gospel tells us that if you follow Jesus, you will have joy unspeakable. And when difficulties and trials and the mission's going and it's difficult and the people that you love are you're struggling and life is pressing in on you, you may not be happy, but you can have joy because you're following the teachings of Jesus. You know what's interesting about this text? It's interesting that this text mirrors Luke 5, 1 through 11, the early call of the disciples. You can flip back. We don't have time right now to read through all of that text, but if you'll look back at Luke 5, chapter 1 through 11, the disciples found themselves in a similar position. Boats, Simon Peter, a little bit of disobedience, the Lord telling them to do something that didn't kind of make sense. Lord, we fished all night. You're sending us out on boats again. And look what happened. Similar scenario. The Lord showed up and showed out. And then he said something incredible. He said, I'm not going to make you fishers of men anymore, I, or fishermen. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And so maybe somewhere along the way as the story is unfolding and they're seeing this thing happening, maybe they're thinking back to that moment as well. Because I want to give you the second resource here. Not only does he give us instruction, number two, very quickly, he gives abundantly. Look in the last part of verse number six, church. It says, so they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. I'm telling you something. The God that I serve has all the resources in the world for you to live successfully. I didn't say to live wealthy. I didn't say to live with prosperity. I said God has all the resources in the world 
for you to live successfully according to him. God has supernatural power. The Bible says that 153 fish were caught. I don't know if I've caught 153 fish in my entire life. Now, if you want to take me fishing, I'll try, but I don't know that I've ever caught 153 fish in my life. In one fishing, just cast the net, boom, 153 fish. Mic dropped. Jesus on the scene, you obeyed. He showed up, he showed out, and he proved a point. He could have sent a few fish. No, he filled their nets to the overflow. And that tells me something. It tells me when I obey God, he is going to give the things that are supernatural. He is going to give the unexplainable. He has the resources. The Bible says that the God that we serve owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Nothing is impossible with God. In fact, Luke chapter 1 verse 37 even says that. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Jesus gives abundantly. God gives abundantly. And finally, I want you to see here that Jesus, who is our resource, when we obey, he gives refocus, restoration, and rest. When you look at verses 7 through 14, you, you see the rest of the events happen. So John recognizes Jesus. He said, oh, Peter, it's the Lord. Well, Peter does something absolutely interesting here. He he jumps off the boat. He's not even going to wait for them to pull the boat up to the shore. He knows it's Jesus. He wants to get back in fellowship with him. He wants to get up there to see Jesus. So he just leaves the rest of the guys that he led on the tree. He's like, see you, boys. I'm jumping off the boat here. And he swims 100 yards. Doesn't sound like a whole lot. It would be for me. I'm, you know, 100 yards. He swims 100 yards. The rest of the guys are still pulling in the catch. He gets up there to Jesus, and Jesus is already preparing a fire. He's already preparing to fix a meal. Can I tell you what's going on here? What's going on here is that once they obeyed their instruction, the instruction of the Lord, first of all, they recognized that was Jesus over there. Now, you can say that it maybe the fog lifted and they saw him. I would tell you that there's a principle in play here that when you're in disobedience, you don't recognize the things of Jesus. You're clouded. Sin clouds those things. But when you begin to obey, you begin to recognize, oh, that's Jesus. He's in that. And I want you to also notice that there was not only refocus, but restoration and rest. There's nothing more intimate than a meal. Do you know what happened here? Jesus is saying to them, you know what? He didn't bring them back on the, on the shore there. They didn't come on the shore to ridicule. They didn't come onto the shore to be reminded of all their past failures. When they came on the shore there with Jesus, Jesus looked at them and said, let's sit down. Let's have breakfast together. You know what that is, church? That's grace. That is grace. So I'm telling you right now where you are, God is, God is a God of grace. And you may be sitting there mulling through all the times that you have failed him in your life. You may be struggling and warring inside of you. But if you will tell the enemy that the enemy has no room to control your thought life, you will find that if you will obey Jesus, he will give you restoration. He desires to restore you, to reconcile you back into a relationship with him where you're fellowshipping with him. And he's not reminding you of all the past failures. Hey, the enemy reminds you of your past failures. The Savior reminds you of his future plans for your life. Then he gives them rest. It's restful around the table. It's restful when you're sitting there and fellowshipping together. Jesus refocuses his disciples back on their original calling and away from the discouragement of their past failures. I'm going to tell you something this morning, church, as we close. Some of you are struggling with your past failures. Some of you in this room are at war right now because the enemy has pulled your focus away from the calling, whether through discouragement, whether through disobedience, whatever the case may be. And I came along this morning in God's word, not because of my own account, but because this is where the Lord led us today to remind you that God is bigger than your past failures. And if you will surrender yourself to him, then he is going to give you restoration.